live in a town where every single person, myself included, is a developer. That's an important and remarkable thing in itself. But today I want to tell you the story of what happened when we all took on an abandoned factory and learned to embrace a process rather than an outcome, when comfort zones became a thing of the past. If you're somebody who likes stories with a happy ending, this will take you out of your comfort zone too. In early September 2014, people living in and around Totnes received this graphic and the following announcement. On the 1 p.m. on Thursday the 25th of September, at the gates of the former Dairy Crest site, an announcement will be made regarding the site's future. We believe this announcement will become part of Totnes community history. A statement will be read out and given to everyone attending and a historic ceremony will take place. The Dairy Crest site had stood at the heart of the economy of this town for decades. At its peak, it brought in milk from 1,300 local farms and made a ton of clotted cream a day. That's a lot of clotted cream. It closed in 2007 and 165 people lost their jobs. And almost immediately, people in this community started rallying around the idea of the community determining the site's future. On the morning of September the 25th, people received either in its entirety or in blocks of 140 characters, thank you Twitter, the following passage from a well-known children's book. And see if you can tell me where this comes from. Somewhere in the distance, a church clock began striking 10. Very slowly, with a loud creaking of rusty hinges, the great iron gates of the factory began to swing open. The crowd became suddenly silent. The children stopped jumping about. All eyes were fixed upon the gates. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, very good. So on the day, about 300 people turned up on a Thursday morning, and here's how our, uh, our town crier got what happened next underway. Oh yay, oh yay. For seven years, the gate of this site, for many years at the heart of our community, has been locked. Today, we are going to open these gates. And so we did and 300 people filed onto the site. A statement was read out detailing the site's future. Everyone was given a copy of it in the golden envelope. Uh, a cake, big, so big it took three people to lift, was shared out, and speeches and, and the photographs were taken. Today, a year later, talking about that day still gives me goosebumps. The air was rich with possibility in a way that in our daily lives it so rarely is. Much of my work over the last 20 years has been about creating places of possibility, openings where another world, another future feels possible. While that day remains one of the most remarkable, what has followed since has contained many such moments. Not all of them so delightful, but all of them part of vibrant and dynamic process. As wonderful as Roald Dahl's story is, real life isn't like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. I'd love to be able to tell you the ending of the Atmos Totnes story, but it doesn't have one. Each step belongs to our 8,500 developers, and each step emerges from the previous ones in way that you, ways that you or I can't imagine or predict. Each step creates what comes next. It's a process without end. In many ways, the story of Atmos Totnes is just the next chapter in an ongoing story of a town reclaiming its future, its hope. Imagine, for example, we reach a stage where our young people have access to good, beautiful homes, are empowered to start new livelihoods on land owned by the community, where local organisations are able to expand what they do to the wider community as part of a vibrant network of social innovators. It would be a brave person who would try to predict what might come from that or on the journey towards that. But our culture hates never-ending stories. They make us acutely uncomfortable. But real change requires stepping out of what feels comfortable if we're really to achieve what we need to achieve. The agreement that we announced that day was groundbreaking. It looked at the site in three parts. The orange part, McCarthy and Stone, a builder of retirement property, would be, would be buying. The purple part, including the historic Brunel building, we, Totnes Community Development Society, the organisation we set up to do that, would be buying for one Totnes pound, our local currency. The blue part of the site, the value would be determined by what we got planning permission for on there, and then we had an option to buy it at that point. The really exciting bit is the route to planning. Using something called a community right to build order, given to communities in the 2012 Localism Act, it says that if you can show you've engaged lots of people, you produced a master plan, you have a referendum. If more than 50% of the people who come out to vote, vote yes, that's full planning permission. A new route to planning for community-led development. 
So what we're doing here covers the whole site. So McCarthy and Stone will only get permission to build what they want to build if 50% of the community will come out and vote in favour of it. Dairy Crest will only get value back for their site if 50% of the people who come out and vote will vote for it. I hope by now you're starting to get a sense of the real radical potential of this. The community stepped up to this challenge because people should step up for each other when they sense that change is possible. All of us at the heart of this process all recognise that what we want to see happen on this site <clears throat> doesn't matter. It's neither here nor there. Our role is to support this community to do something remarkable, to meet its needs in a way that the conventional developer-led model usually fails to do. Development is usually an extractive industry designed to meet the needs of economic growth and distant investors rather than local people and their local economies. Stepping up to do something different is challenging, but that makes it all the more important that we do it. I'm telling you this story about eight months before that referendum is due to take place. I can't therefore tell you whether the community voted for this or not. But it shouldn't matter at what point in this process I tell you the story, because what matters is the process that our 8,500 developers jumped in feet first and trusted the collective to deliver what it needs. Shortly after that event at the gates, one of my colleagues suggested that I needed to, quote, fall in love with the process to give up any attachment I might have to what should happen on that site. It turned out to be the best advice anyone gave me on this project because what I want is just one eight and a half thousandth of a wider process. What's so much more important is that we enable everybody to fall in love with this process too. We know this town is feisty, remarkable, creative. It's a spirit that's come through today already. And that spirit underpinned the campaign that got us to this stage in the first place. From the day the factory closed, we campaigned, we held public meetings. It built up in 2012 to a really focused campaign where we unveiled high profile patrons. What we noticed was that people stopped talk calling it the Dairy Crest site. They started calling it the Atmos site. It became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And that was one of the things that brought Dairy Crest to the table. In August 2014, we signed a contract about that thick. And that enabled the project to start moving forward. We opened the old site office up as the Atmos Totnes hub. There's a consultation working with Encounters Arts, brilliant community engagement consultation organization. We, we designed it around the idea of the past, the present, and the future of the site. So the first part people came into was the past. People came in to tell their stories about the past of the site. On the second day we were open, this gentleman came in. He said, if you add up myself, my father, my immediate family, my wife, her immediate family, together we worked on that site for 150 years. He said, I lost my job in July 2007. I was off work with depression for the next six years. He said, this is the first time I've been back here since. It took me a lot to come here today. There were a lot of tears in that room over the next eight weeks. It became a kind of self-organized Dairy Crest factory museum. This is a photograph that he brought in of his own father working there in the 1950s. The present section of the, of, of the hub brought people up to speed with the agreement that we had signed with Dairy Crest. The future part invited people to dream. It said, here's a blank slate. Anything could happen here. Some people spent hours working on drawings, writing everything they thought ought to happen on that site. One person said to me, I've just realized this is the first time in my life I've ever really been consulted about anything. Just consider the implications of that for a moment. Another person said, you can't help but participate. Imagine if more areas of our civic life were like that. During the time that hub was open, about 1,300 people came through the doors and another 800 were engaged at outreach events across the town. And most of them left some kind of input. You might imagine that making sense of all of that input, this random sort of wild, eclectic soup of ideas, would have been really difficult. But a strong message came through very clearly. People wanted and needed housing that was actually affordable, beautiful, energy efficient, that they could help build. They wanted small scale enterprises, manufacturers, processors working collaboratively. They wanted a mixed use development powered by renewable energy with edible and beautiful landscaping. They wanted good transport links to the rest of the community, a place for visitors to stay, somewhere that the town could be proud of. We also formed what we called our community design team. 20 people who had been through the hub, they gave up two weekends. We walked the site, we got to know it. We walked in Totnes and they got a sense of, well, why does this place work? What, why do we love this place? What are the patterns that underpin this place that mean we all love it so much? 
we tried to blur that edge between professional designer and everybody else. They worked in groups, they worked up an, uh, an initial master plan, the degree of consensus was phenomenal. So then we had our set of design principles, we had the initial master plan. We then held another, held another round of consultation, people came in, signed that off, that's been the foundation on which we've moved forward ever since. At the same time, while the community were filling the hub with its ideas, our professional design team got to work, filling the, drilling holes on site, looking for groundwater and contamination, looking for lizards and bats, uh, trying to make sense of the legacy of buildings we had inherited. While Charlie had inherited a chocolate factory, all chocolate rivers and waterfalls, we had inherited eight acres of derelict and potentially dangerous sheds, and we needed the right people to help us make sense of them. At the same time, our architects got to work trying to turn the community's dreams into reality to give form to what people had so clearly said they needed. So this is what a community of developers looks like. First of all, we have our, uh, our directors of Totnes Community Development Society. We're all volunteers. Then we have our professional design team who bring the expertise that we need. Then we have our community design team, many of whom are also Atmos ambassadors. They've agreed to have 100 conversations with people in their part of town about Atmos. These are all the people who've been to our consultations, people we've talked to in the street, the people who hopefully come next year will come out and vote and make this thing a reality. What people have designed is really extraordinary. We're looking at a development of about 65 truly affordable houses built using a community build process held in a community land trust. The Brunel building being reopened as a public space for music and events and so on. A new hotel, a school for food entrepreneurs, a brewery, an energy centre, a youth hub, a health and wellbeing centre, all with edible landscaping powered with renewable energy designed to minimise the need for, for, for public transport. For, no, for, for car transport, that's what I meant to say. Being part of this has been a phenomenal process. All of us at the heart of this process have had to, uh, have had to learn that it's okay to feel unnerved, often acutely so. The French painter Jean de Buffet once said, art's best moments are when it forgets what it's called. For me, our best moments as change makers, as activists, as campaigners, are when we forget to, move, to, to do what's expected of us. When we step out of the comfort zones of the language, the culture, the fonts, the appearance that define that. And we step into something else. Atmos has been a real example of that for me. Our professional design team tell us one of the things they love about working on this project is that we give them permission, we push them out of their comfort zones and really invite them to be brilliant in a way that on many other jobs they're not. There's an old saying, you have to go out on a limb because that's where the fruits are. I think all of us at the heart of this process have also experienced falling out of the tree and you'll be amazed at what you can learn and what you find lying face down in the grass. This is an activity from the hub, when the hub was open, called Anyone Who. The idea was written on each of these hearts is a key moment in the evolution of the Atmos story. People were given a strand of wool and invited to tie it round the ones that they were part of, that they remember. Over time, you build up a sense of how, of how everybody's stories start to converge. For me, one of the key indicators of the success of this process is the thought that although I'm up here giving this presentation, any of you who live in and around Totnes could be up here doing this. You would tell of a different pathway through your own strand of wool, if you like. You would note different highlights, but you would tell a story of Atmos Totnes because you were here too. When I said this was a never-ending story, I meant it. Because it's not just about what happens on the Dairy Crest site. That's just the first chapter. The real story we're telling here is why it matters that communities own assets and what a game changer that is. This is a model of development where who owns it, how it's done, who does it, what it's built from, all really matter. When communities are able to design, own and develop their own assets, they're so much more in control of their destiny than they were before. It's a never-ending story because it changes the context of where people live and how they work. Future chapters will include energy generation owned by the community, investment managed in a different way, the capacity to rethink our food system, and the opportunity to, to, to create employment, training, housing, in such a way that we no longer see the annual exodus of 18-year-olds in this town four weeks after they get their A-level results, because once again this town has been unable to provide the housing and the employment opportunities that could have enabled them to stay. During the campaign I did this series of things called Atmos Voices. 
We went out and talked to shopkeepers, publicans, taxi drivers, people all across the town and said, why does this matter? Why does this site matter? What would you like to see happen on this site? The only one I never used was with a retired local politician who said to me, well, it's all very well, but you know, this town, it's all talk, it comes up with all these great ideas and they just never happen. I hope that now, years later, with an agreement this thick signed, hundreds of thousands of pounds of investment raised, design work happening, a referendum set to happen, that he will have changed his mind. And that many people will have changed their sense of what's possible for this place, where we could go, what we could create, that we no longer need to be passive, but we can actually uh, take command of these things ourselves. It's a story that, whether it ends today or in three generations' time, is only possible because we've given up on the need to know the last chapter. And actually, you can keep your chocolate rivers and waterfalls, your edible marshmallow pillows, your everlasting gobstoppers. Because every stage of this process, the process of healing this decrepit factory, which for so many years meant so very, very much to so many people, has been remarkable. Just speaking for myself, I've met so many people, learned so much. And as my colleagues suggested, I have fallen in love with this process. Perhaps you're a developer too. You just hadn't realised it yet. Perhaps everyone where you live is a developer too. Turn the first page. Your story starts here. Thank you very much. <laughs>